This is the 50th anniversary of our center, and we've been putting on uh, different events, uh, one big one every month, uh, that examines the question of Japan's role and relevance in, on the global stage today. Um, so last month we had uh, Ogata Sadako talk about diplomacy and foreign aid. The month before, uh, Haruki Murakami, the novelist, talked about Japan's uh, literature and the globalization of it. Uh, and today we've got this wonderful program on sports and in particular uh, baseball. Um, you know, my own specialization is in Japanese Buddhism, so you know, this is not an area I know much about, but you know what, even I know that Japan won the uh, World Baseball Classics, and I know that there are over a dozen uh, Japanese playing in the Major League Baseball today, uh, with many teams, uh, with some teams even having two Japanese players on their, on their rosters. And today uh, and tomorrow, we've got a wonderful l lineup of distinguished uh, scholars and, and practitioners, people in the, in the field, who uh, have made a major impact in raising the awareness of Japanese baseball uh, in Japan as, as well as here in the U.S. So that's our program, uh, Baseball U.S. and Japan, and we're going to be looking at three major themes. The first, uh, baseball in Japan, its history and the culture of, uh, of baseball in Japan. Number two, uh, the ways in which Japanese baseball has become a part of a global phenomenon, including here in the U.S., looking at um, uh, players who have, who have uh, come over to uh, the United States. And then number three, uh, Japanese-American baseball, the history uh, of, of Japanese-Americans who have made an impact uh, in this area as well. And we have got some very distinguished uh, speakers uh, today. I'm going to, uh, as they come up, uh, give, give a more careful introduction, but uh, let me just mention that we have uh, two scholars, uh, Professor Andrew Gordon from Harvard, uh, Professor uh, William Kelly from Yale, uh, uh, both authors of important uh, work on uh, this topic of uh, baseball, U.S. and Japan. Um, I'm going to introduce them uh, a little bit more carefully later. But it's very exciting for us to have uh, two, I think, legends um, who have broken barriers in many different ways. Uh, Mr. Uh, Masanori Murakami, the first Japanese to play here in, in the U United States in the Major League uh, Baseball system, um, uh, played for the San Francisco uh, Giants back in the uh, 60s. Would you, would you just give a hand to welcome him? We also have in the room uh, uh, not, the, not the very first American to play in uh, Japanese professional baseball, but I think the American who had uh, the most impact uh, as a major leaguer coming into uh, the Japanese uh, professional baseball playing for the Yomiuri Giants. Would you please welcome Mr. Warren Cromarty. So I'm going to introduce all of these speakers and then also our um, uh, uh, Jack Sakazaki, our moderator uh, later today um, uh, uh, as we go through uh, the panel. But um, I want to, uh, we want, what we want to do right now is show a section. We, we originally thought we might show the whole thing, but we, we're going to uh, try to give more time to our distinguished uh, guests today by uh, not showing the whole thing, but the first section of a documentary uh, about Bobby Valentine, um, you know, former manager of Mets and then uh, Chiba Lotte Marines uh, today um, that ESPN put together. And uh, we thought that might help with getting a little bit of some, some visuals in your mind about baseball uh, and baseball culture and fandom in, in Japan. And uh, we'll start with that and then we'll, 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 I'll, I'll introduce our, our, our speakers. So if we could, uh, Matthew, if you could. You can't do anything about the past, you can't do anything about the future. You only can do things about the present, and I want everyone to understand every pitch that we throw or that we swing at is the most important. These pitches. To our distinguished guests, um, I hope from the documentary you got a little bit of a sense of the flavor of Japanese baseball and, and fan culture, uh, as well as the ways in which, you know, the global 
uh, network in which baseball uh, happens with managers and players uh, in Japan uh, from outside of Japan. To get a little bit more into uh, this question of Japanese baseball culture, I'd like to ask, I think, the preeminent scholar on that subject, uh, Professor uh, William Kelly, to uh, start us off. Professor Kelly uh, is a Sumitomo professor of Japanese studies at Yale University, uh, professor of, the anthropo of anthropology and chair of the anthropology department. Uh, he is well known as a social and historical anthropologist of Japan, um, wrote a number of books on uh, uh, 19th century and uh, Tokugawa period um, uh, agriculture, um, with book titles with book titles like "Water Control in Tokugawa Japan," "Deference and Defiance in 19th Century Japan." But over time, uh, Professor Kelly's work has shifted to uh, the contemporary, shifted to sports, and in particular baseball. Uh, he's put out books uh, as an editor um, of books such as "Fanning the Flames." Uh, fandom and consumer culture in contemporary Japan, and the sporting life, sports and body culture uh, in uh, modern Japan. And most recently, he's been doing field work as an anthropologist uh, for quite some time on baseball culture in uh, Osaka and Kobe in particular, and has a book that's uh, forthcoming called The Hanshin Tigers and Professional Baseball in Modern Japan. Uh, please welcome uh, Professor William Kelly from Yale. Thank you very much, Professor Williams. Uh, it's an honor to <clears throat> participate as a uh, sibling university and Council of Japanese Studies in this 50th cele uh, year celebration uh, of the Council, the center here at Berkeley, and I bring the best wishes from your colleagues on the East Coast uh, for the program that you've put together for this entire year. Um, it's a special honor for me to join a panel with uh, two of the most important individuals in recent Japanese history who have made remarkable contributions to Japanese baseball and to U.S.-Japan sport relationships, um, including Murakami-san, um, here looking perhaps a bit younger on the left, um, and Mr. Cromarty, who is not only, just as I'm mentioning Mr. Cromarty's name, the, the screen goes dead. <coughs> Uh, godfather of Sadaharu O's uh, son and uh, author of one of the best books on Japanese baseball ever, Slugging It Out in Japan. Um, actually, I want to take up a question that is not explicit in that documentary, the first section of which you just saw, but which actually lies behind that documentary and a lot of discussion about what's going on in professional baseball in Japan today, which is it's facing a crisis. It's facing a serious crisis that's going to demand some very creative thinking, some very creative actions in order to continue um, as it has uh, existed for the last uh, 70 years, um, whether it has a future or not in Japan. And if so, um, how is it going to work itself out of the problems, the challenges that it faces at the moment? Um, you have, as this documentary, one of the people who might be able to do that through um, ideas about marketing, ideas about drawing in a whole new group of fans, ideas about repositioning baseball as a sport and as a sports product um, in Japan. Um, you may be less familiar with the figure on the right, um, Professor, I mean, uh, Ambassador Kato was for a number of years the Japanese ambassador to the United States in Washington, um, a, uh, a lifelong a diplomat. Um, he was one of the few individuals who were important in bringing the Washington Nationals um, to Washington, D.C. during his time as ambassador very knowledgeable about Major League Baseball, very familiar with the owners, um, very familiar with the commissioner's office, um, and as some of you know, um, left uh, the Gaima Show and has become the commissioner of professional baseball in Japan. Um, this, as you know, is one of the problems that Japanese baseball, professional baseball, has faced for years. Um, a very weak uh, commissioner's office that has very little uh, authority, very little control over um, the clubs, the owners. Um, and if anyone, it seems to me, um, can bring some new management uh, to Japanese professional baseball, um, it is Ambassador Kato, or now a Commissioner Kato. So let me keep talking while he's trying to uh, set it up. Um, because I actually want to approach this question of the 
crisis in Japanese professional baseball, what might be done from a slightly different point of view. Um, I myself, as an anthropologist, um, was working not in Tokyo, in Osaka, trying to understand Japanese baseball from the perspective of Kansai, uh, Japan's second city, second uh, region. Um, I've been following Hanshin Tigers for about a dozen years, and if any team has been doing well, it is Hanshin in terms of trying to reinvent and reposition itself. And so how Hanshin goes is to a certain extent some evidence as to how Japanese professional baseball is doing and will be able to face these kinds of challenges. Um, the old Hanshin Tigers, some of you know perhaps all too well, um, as permanent cellar dwellers, not so much lovable losers, but perhaps faded failures, um, a kind of combination of the Chicago Cubs and the Boston Red Sox, um, have become over the last five or six years the sort of new Hanshin Tigers, not as perennial champions, uh, but at least as top shelf competitors. Um, as regular uh, competition in the, in the A-League, won the league championship twice. Now, I've been a Red Sox fan um, for the last 56 years, and I can assure you that the past five years um, have been more fun and more satisfying and more enjoyable than the previous 50. Despite our wallowing uh, as Red Sox nation um, in those 50 years, it's more fun to be um, uh, supporting a winning team. Question is, is this so? <clears throat> Question is, is this so um, for the Hanshin Tigers? Um, they have been winning. Um, and do they represent the possibility of teams being profitable and productive and drawing in uh, new fans? Um, the, the old Hanshin Tigers had a number of distinctive features. Um, and if any of you have followed Hanshin, you will recognize them immediately. They were very much. Um, a second city club. Osaka and Tokyo, it's hard to remember now from the vantage point of the early 21st century, but around the time the Murakami-san was coming up with Nankai Hawks in the early 1960s, it was still a time when Osaka, at least economically, could rival Tokyo. There was still a relative balance between Kanto and Kansai. In the 1960s, that changed, Tokyo Olympics most symbolically, but gradually Tokyo became the center of Japan. Um, and Osaka, uh, Kansai uh, developed very strongly through the Hanshin Tigers in particular, um, a sense of a kind of second, a second city uh, a complex. Um, it also had among the most uh, sort of claustrophobic and inbred um, feelings as a team. All of its managers came from within Hanshin. Um, it tended to uh, keep uh, players um, long after other teams might have, might have traded them or moved them. It was very much an underachieving uh, team as well. Um, the management, both in the front office and in the parent company, um, the Hanshin uh, Electric Company, um, were a very much um, a, a dysfunctional, very much intrusive, um, very uh, uh, not at all knowledgeable um, about baseball, but as a small parent company, I'm quite anxious um, as a parent coach of a star athlete, um, uh, probably caused much more harm than good um, to the operations of the team um, and the performance of the players. Um, they were playing, of course, in the stadium, one of the most famous stadiums in Japan, uh, Koshien, which was even before professional baseball, uh, the home of middle school and then high school national tournaments. So literally the pressures of playing in the mecca of baseball in Japan over the years played um, on the psyche of the players and the psyche um, of the team. Um, Hanshin was the center of a voracious and prying sports media for decades. Um, Hanshin itself controlled none of the five sports dailies um, or the other press um, that kept an around-the-clock watch and a constant presence on Hanshin, on Hanshin players. Um, the, uh, the, the foibles and the frustrations of Hanshin baseball were constantly on the front pages of the daily sports papers, whether it was managers who were being asked to resign, um, owners uh, who were being uh, disciplined or getting into trouble. Um, here are anyone who has been to Japan knows um, the kiosks in the train stations um, or elsewhere. I mean, literally the fountains of sports dailies that uh, come out um, of the kiosks that people consumed. Um, here is the press keeping an all-night watch on the owner's uh, home. Um, the owner, uh, Kuma, for many years, um, a reclusive and media-shy um, uh, uh, individual. Um, that is, Hanshin baseball was very much 
a regional, a local, a soap opera, um, a rather melodramatic uh, constant uh, theme of, as I say, dysfunction and underperformance. Um, nonetheless, um, drawing, uh, again, as many of you know, among the most passionate um, fans in Japan. Um, many of the uh, cheers, many of the fan practices developed first at Koshien and spread to other leagues. Um, the fans were organized into fan clubs. Fan clubs were organized into several powerful associations um, that were exuberant, um, that were independent um, of the Hanshin Club, that were resolutely um, resistant to the efforts of the club um, and, the, uh, and, and the company to try to control and contain um, uh, the fans. It was a very difficult relationship that the Hanshin Club had um, with its uh, passionate fans. <clears throat> As all of this led to an abiding fascination by uh, people in Kansai, particularly people in Osaka um, and Eastern Kobe, with the Hanshin Tigers as a, as a, as a kind of long-running uh, baseball uh, soap opera. Um, what's happened now? Uh, well, there were a number of moves in the early, in, in, in the early decade um, going outside finally to find um, two uh, giants hating um, outside managers, Nomura um, and then, and then uh, Hoshina. Um, the uh, media averse and much reviled owner, uh, Kuma, finally started spending money on some free agents um, and, be and the team began to enjoy um, a lot of success. The ownership also changed. It's indicative of what is roiling the waters um, in Japanese professional baseball now. The sales, the consolidations of some of the teams. This was a controversy several years ago um, in which the venture capitalist uh, merger acquisitions and uh, Murakami tried to buy up um, the stock in Hanshin. The result was eventually that Hanshin's electric company's arch rival, Hong Q, um, that had uh, sponsored a baseball team for many uh, years ended up buying uh, the Hanshin company. They have kept the name of the Hanshin Tigers, injected actually some new capital um, uh, and, some new, and some new management. But it's sort of, for, to a Hanshin fan, the ultimate embarrassment that Hong should come in um, and take over uh, the, 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 the larger uh, Hanshin parent, uh, parent company. It has had the interesting effect, though, of further consolidating Hanshin as the identity, the baseball identity of, of, of Kansai um, and drawing the fans together around, um, the, around the Hanshin Tigers. Um, the third thing that has happened, the club has been successful, ownership has changed, um, has been the changing fan base. If you go to Koshien now, as opposed to go, go to Koshien eight or nine years ago, you won't uh, uh, see much difference on the surface. Um, it's the same fans, it's the same hitting marches, but over the last couple of years, several things have happened, both to the Hanshin Tigers and to several other teams, that have resulted in a very important shift um, in the nature of fans, fan clubs, and their relationships uh, to the companies. There were a couple of, 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 of celebrated cases, at least in the Japanese press. Um, uh, several of the fan clubs, or individuals in the fan clubs, um, in effect stole the copyrights of some of these hitting marches uh, to collect royalties. They were caught out. They turned out to be connected to organized crime. There was also some or Yakuza involvement in several of the fan clubs. The result was, um, a number of years ago that Hanshin, um, Yomiuri, and Japanese professional baseball in general began to get much more strict um, with fan club operations um, to control the sales of block tickets to these clubs, some of whom would then resell them um, at a profit to require licensing of the clubs, um, uh, ID cards for individuals who are uh, cheerleaders, um, and to begin to try to control more effectively the marketing of the goods associated um, with a particular team. This is especially true. Um, in the case of Hanshin. It offers an interesting case in the capacity of these Japanese baseball clubs to develop profitable goods marketing operations. Um, it has had uh, to uh, some longtime Hanshin fans an unfortunate uh, tendency towards acutifying. I mean, pink is now a color, a popular color of, 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 of goods and fans, and it has brought in, as I say, new fans, some of which you saw in the Bobby Valentine uh, uh, documentary, but it has really changed the nature of fan clubs and fan club involvement, especially for, especially for Hanshin. Um, I don't know if the fierce tiger um, is becoming Hello Kitty, but there is a very deliberate 
um, uh, uh, intention on the part of clubs like Hanshin and the league in general um, to bring um, the exuberance uh, and the behavior of the fan clubs more directly under the control um, of the individual club. As I say, both for questions of order um, and also for questions of generating the kind of market that will give them the revenue uh, that will give them the revenue to continue. Um, <clears throat> Now, I don't know whether the Hanshin Tigers can save Japan. I rather doubt it. But it's interesting to follow the changes in the Hanshin Tigers, as I say, in the club ownership, um, in, uh, in, in, the, in the fan organization over this decade as a way of assessing whether, in fact, um, uh, these, these clubs um, will be able to weather, uh, weather these challenges. Um, I actually am not a prognosticator. But if I were, I think I would be somewhat pessimistic. Um, about the uh, options that um, not just individual teams like Hanshin, but Japanese professional baseball more generally has, um, wedged as it is between changes that are happening in Major League Baseball and baseball more generally in North America, and also um, the challenges of soccer, uh, particularly in the East Asia uh, region. Um, to be sure, what we know, most, what we know best um, is the bright flight of some of the stars of Japanese professional baseball into the major leagues. Um, they've been bobbleheaded and they've been ice cream branded. Um, they've been uh, uh, considered the Godzilla of, of, of Manhattan. Um, there are ways in which they have been celebrated and hopefully um, Andy Gordon will be able to talk about that for at least, uh, for at least one of them. But even more importantly, this week's uh, case of course of Tazawa Junichi who was assigned by the Red Sox to a, con a three-year contract is actually only the latest of something that's been going on below the media radar screen um, for the last 10 or 12 years, which is the much larger migration of young players out of Japan, either on their own, um, signing a, a training contracts um, or rookie contracts with major league associations. Um, the numbers are in the order of 80 or 90 individuals who have come over the last uh, decade. That represents, as I say, an erosion before Japanese professional baseball can even get this, these people signed uh, to contracts there. I say Tazawa is on the front pages of the sports papers this week, but this is only the latest of a much larger as a migration of potential talent from Japan uh, to North America, and even uh, less known uh, to Americans or even Japanese, has been a migration of young Japanese talent to Taiwan and Korea over the last 10 or 12 years. There have been something like 80 Japanese players, not just aging professionals seeking um, a few final years of their career by playing in the Korean professional leagues or the Taiwanese professional leagues, but also younger players who are bypassing uh, Japanese, Japanese professional baseball. And there is, I hope Mr. Cromarty will uh, talk about uh, the other samurai, uh, for which I brought my official samurai bears uh, hat. Uh, this effort, uh, not just individuals, but to create a team um, in the uh, independent league in Southern California, of which he was uh, the principal, that brought over an entire group um, of young Japanese players to gain experience here, to gain exposure, and perhaps to develop uh, direct contacts with the U.S. So on a number of different levels, uh, major league stars, minor league individuals, and special initiatives um, like the, uh, the Samurai Bears, not the Berkeley Bears. Um, there have been efforts um, that challenge uh, Jap uh, Japanese professional baseball on one side. And on the other side, of course, is soccer. Uh, now, since the formation of the Japanese professional leagues in 1991, um, soccer has been anticipated to be um, the sports future for Japan. Uh, several times that promise um, has proven to be short-lived or premature, but it may well be over the next five or ten years, something to watch very closely, that soccer will finally gain uh, both the participation base um, and the fan base and the organization and the media contracts um, to challenge uh, Japanese professional baseball for the allegiances um, of, the, of the younger fans. Why? Well, one reason is um, that soccer, much more than baseball, um, is a vehicle for playing out some of the East Asian rivalries 
between Japan and Korea and China um, and, and Taiwan um, than, uh, uh, than, than baseball. It's also the opening to uh, Europe and, and the European leagues. So it seems to me that Bobby Valentine um, and Commissioner Kato um, have their work cut out for them, or as symbols of um, the needs to develop much more aggressive and creative marketing on the one hand, and much more aggressive and creative um, and centralized uh, management um, on the other um, for JPB, Japanese Professional Baseball, um, to meet these twin challenges of uh, baseball in North America on the one side and soccer on East Asia, uh, in, in East Asia and in Europe um, on the other. Um, perhaps uh, uh, Professor Gordon will be able to uh, talk uh, more about Matsuzaka, um, and I sus but I suspect um, to take a somewhat pessimistic view um, of the next five or eight years in Japanese professional baseball, um, that there's going to be one, there's going to be more than one uh, player who's going to be crying um, about the uh, about the fate of Japanese professional baseball. Thank you very much. You know, uh, our next speaker, Warren Cromartie, is, is somebody that uh, when I was growing up in Japan in the 80s, I was you know, a junior high school, high school student uh, uh, at the time when uh, Warren Cromartie uh, played with the Yomiuri Giants. He was just an absolute uh, legend uh, in, in his time. Uh, I, I, to be honest, a, a confessional, uh, you know, in Tokyo, you can support the Giants, you can support the Yakult Swallows. And, I was all, I've always been a Yoko Swallows fan, and, and, and uh, so, so we viewed, <laughs> but, but with utmost respect for uh, <laughs> Warren Cromartie. Um, you know, uh, of course, before his uh, time in Japan, uh, Warren Cromartie was already a Major League uh, Baseball player debuting with the Montreal Expos uh, back in 1974. But, um, uh, and as I mentioned, not the first American to play major league play play in, in in Japan, but probably the one who came at the prime kind of peak time of, of his career and just had a uh, had a amazing seven seasons with the Giants, uh, Yomiuri Giants. And I think in was it 1989 uh, was the MVP uh, of the Central Leagues, and he chronicled all of this in a book that uh, Professor Kelly mentioned, uh, a very wonderful read, uh, slugging, slugging It Out uh, in Japan. Um, uh, after his, his uh, years in Japan, he uh, again came back and played in the major leagues uh, with the Kansas City Royals in 1991. Uh, and since his retirement um, from playing, he's uh, been on TV commentating, he uh, has a show uh, on radio, uh, in, in Florida, and um, uh, as Professor Kelly mentioned, that kind of at the end there, uh, also managed, uh, has experience uh, with managing uh, the uh, Japan uh, Samurai Bears. Um, so uh, I don't want to take too, too long. I, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Warren Cromati to uh, talk about his experiences and uh, please welcome him once again. Ah. Thank you. Minasama, ohayo gozaimasu. Ohayo. Good morning. Well, I don't have a computer, so I'm going to do this by uh, natural, okay? Well, 1984, how did you young? 1984. I was going to, I was a free agent, and I was on my way to the San Francisco Giants to sign a contract. And I get a phone call. My agent gets a phone call. And uh, Kromarty, the we have a very important man from Tokyo, Japan, wants to talk with us. I says, about what? He goes, about going to Japan to play. So I says, I don't think there's going to be a chance for me to go to Japan. I was 31 years old. I was coming from the Montreal Expos. I was young, just coming into my own prime here. I'm getting ready to go play for the San Francisco Giants at the, the old ballpark here where they play now, where they used to play here, Candlestick. Anyway, uh, Mr. Herano came to my agent and myself, says, uh, Mr. Kurmati-san, we like you very much. And we have a manager who you may know by the name of Sadahara O. I says, oh yes, we all know who Sadahara O is in the major leagues. 
So uh, we would like for you to come play for us. And by the way, it, this was the 50th year of the Yamiuri Shimbun at the time. Just like today is the 50th year for this anniversary here. So it's a, it's a, it's a real uh, interesting uh, opportunity to be here on another 50th year anniversary. But the Yamiuri uh, Shimbun giants say, how much would it take for you to play for us? We want you to play for us. I go, huh? I don't think so. I'm going to continue my season in major leagues. How much you want, Krumatisan? <laughs> uh, how much I want? He goes, how much you want? So I said, let me think about it. One day went by, two days went by, three days went by. So finally, they kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming. I said, you know what? Let me write down a few numbers with a few zeros behind it, you know? Big numbers, so go in big numbers. So I know if maybe they see this number, they say, nah, we cannot pay. We cannot pay this money. So I write down on a piece of paper, and Mr. Herano says, okay. <laughs> My wife looks at me, she says, sign. <laughs> so I had to think about maybe 10 minutes, I had to decide. I was 31 years old, very young, and uh, of course, I signed. <laughs> because I, I remember watching TV in the Yumiri Giants, like the Yankees or the Dodgers, very big team. And I was a big fan of Sadahara O. I didn't know Mr. O at the time. But I always hear about Osan through the major leagues. He's a very popular hitter, home run hitter, home run king, along with Hank Aaron the same time. So I made the decision, and we make a lot of news, and uh, it was a very difficult decision. I remember when I first arrived in Japan, the 747 plane, we were going to get off the plane, and the stewardess from Japan Airlines come to me, Kurmati-san, you have to be, please wait. We want you to be the last one off the plane. And I look down from the plane, and I see almost 200 reporters with cameras. <laughs> and I say to myself, what did I get myself into? So anyway, uh, we got off the plane. They're taking pictures. And uh, we meet the general manager who never came to Narita, who came to see me and made a big impression. But I remember my first, my first practice in Japan. And I had to meet all my teammates, Sadoka, Egawa, uh, Shinozuka, Sumi. Some of you know who they are. I had to meet everybody. And I meet Mr. O for the first time. I met Mr. O. And uh, I realized this was Mr. O's first year manager, Kantaku, for the Giants and the big 50th year anniversary. So it was a big, it was, everything was so big. So he said to me, you know, Kurmati-san, you are the Messiah. <laughs> I, said, I said, Messiah? So I said, no, I'm just a baseball player. I'm not Messiah. So we want you to help us win championship. We need to win this year. So after my first year and taking the bullet trains to, from Tokyo to Osaka, that was a big experience for me with my family in Japan. The bullet trains, uh, they go so fast. I know everything go by the clock in Japan. It's the Shinkansen leaving 11.15. Shinkansen leaving 11.15. <laughs> so I, I immediately under, started to understand Japanese culture, Japanese style. And I knew me being a very famous Major League Baseball player to go play in Japan, I wanted to be like everybody else. See, that's the key for anybody working in another foreign in, uh, atmosphere or a foreign country. You have to learn how to adapt. And that was my big key to my success, learning how to adapt, doing what the Japanese do. 
because everybody's looking at me because I'm making all this money and I'm from America, I'm a major league, we want you to do this. I want to be like the Japanese. I wanted to do like the Japanese do. I wanted to eat the rice, I wanted to eat the, the sushi, but I, didn't eat, I don't like natto. <laughs> I don't eat natto. I remember my first time eating natto, I made a mistake and I bought it on the Shinkansen. You know the lady comes by, Shinkansen, so I buy this uh, thing in a box. And all my teammates looking at me says, you know, you, I don't think you like that. <laughs> I say, it's okay, let me try, let me try. And I open it, like, oh. <laughs> oh. So not to, I don't like. But my family went to school in Japan. They went to international school in Japan. They, my, 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 my kids, they really love Japan. They always want to go back to visit Japan. And you saw the picture of me and Mr. Sadahara O, my manager. And I have to tell you, if it wasn't for Osan, I wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't have been successful in Japan because he helped me adapt to certain situations. Because Osan, you know, is half Chinese, half Japanese. So he knows what it is to be alone sometimes, which I felt alone very much in Japan. But he made it better for me. He made me understand where I was and what this Japanese baseball is all about in living in Japan. I enjoyed the Shinkansen from April to October. I watched the, uh, the farmers planting the rice early April, March, April, planting the rice. And by September, I see the rice has grown so, so far up. So that's my memory in Japan and learning to play with my teammates you know, I didn't speak any Japanese, but baseball is one sport that you don't have to speak the language because baseball is the same all over the world. You know, it's played the same. But I made, I made my mark in how I played and how I communicated with my teammates. I wanted to be a part of the team. I, wanted to be, I want my teammates to know that I'm just not here for the money. I'm here to do a job. I'm here to win a championship and hopefully change Japanese baseball, which we did. Randy Bass, myself, Boomer Wells, Bryanto. At that time, we helped change Japanese baseball. 80, from 84 to 1990, we changed Japanese baseball. We made it more exciting. You saw the Hunshin fans here. Let me tell you something. I played in that ballpark, and I played center field, and I know those fans. <laughs> I was real close to the Hunshin fans, okay? And every time I hit a home run, I would hear it, okay? And they are the most exciting, loyal fans I've ever seen, yes, including the Boston Red Sox, like you said. They are very, very loyal. They love their Hanshin Tigers. <laughs> every day, very loyal. So with, with, with that in mind, my experience was, it's a part of me. Japan is my second home. I retired in 1991. My last year with the Giants was 1990. I've been going back to Japan for the last 10 years, do television shows, make special appearances, and to keep my face in the, in the uh, Japanese eyes. So I am truly blessed to be here. I am truly blessed to, 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 to be a part of a, a country, a different country who, who has accepted me a black man in Japan at that time can still go back to Japan and from the minute I walk onto the airplane, to the airport, Narita, anywhere I go in Japan, even sometime here in America, I'm recognized. And I'm so blessed by that. I'm so lucky to have that opportunity because of Japanese baseball and what has Japan's done for me as a person. And uh, to be here and to to listen to everybody speak here, to have you wake up this morning and come here to listen to me, what I have to say about my experience in Japan and Sadahara, oh, how much he means to me. He's my son's godfather. We become very, very close. After many years, five, six years, he was my manager. My, my youngest, his name is Cody O. Oh. He's, my, he's my son's godfather. And we all know how he's not healthy right now, Osan. He's not doing the best of health. But uh, he's a champion. Without him, 
I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be successful. Because, you know, the Giants are like the Yankees and the Dodgers. You know, Hunch and Tigers and Giants are, you know, is always a uh, good competition. So with that experience, I will never forget, I wrote a book slugging it out in Japan, my experiences about playing in Japan, and a little bit about my life. And they did a movie, I don't know if you saw the movie uh, with Tom Selleck, uh, Mr. Baseball, they screwed it up, okay? <laughs> Hollywood screwed it up. Not like, if somebody like Kerry would have did it, you know, we would have done it right. But um, that was a great experience writing the book and they did a movie. But um, Japan is in trouble now as far as baseball. As you know, a lot of baseball players are going to the major leagues now. I'm not too crazy about that, but it's an opportunity now for Japan to try to do something with Japanese baseball, keeping their own players in Japan, either expanding another team, or you have American managers now changing the game of baseball a little bit in Japan. Bobby Valentine, you have Mr. Brown with the Hiroshima, uh, with Hiroshima Carp. They're trying to change baseball and keep it alive in Japan. Television rating is not so good now. I remember when I played, Giants on TV every night. Good ratings every night. Sunday night baseball. Now it's changing. I'm a little sad with that. But as long as you have the Yumuri Giants and the Hunshin Tigers, and now you have Lotte with Bobby Valentine. Hopefully in the near future, things will get better. But my thing is to you for inviting me here. I want to thank you so, so much. I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to let you know that Japan is a part of me. It is, I live it every day. And uh, even I try to show off my little Nihonji when I speak a little Japanese. When I go to Binihana, I try to speak a little Japanese, you know? <laughs> so I can continue to practice my Japanese. And I enjoy going to Japan. It's, like I said, it's, a, it's, it's opened so many doors for me. And uh, baseball is played all around the world. It's played the same. Maybe I didn't communicate, but I learned to speak Japanese a little bit. I like all the food, except natto, you know. Rame is a favorite of mine. Sushi is a favorite of mine. Sashimi is a favorite of mine but I'm not touching not, not though. Anyway, I want to thank you so much for having me here. Later on, we're going to have uh, little questions and answers. I'm looking forward to uh, some of your questions, but it's been a very, very uh, great life in Japan to play with the, world, with the world's famous team, the Yumuri Giants, for seven years, and I made friends from that, and I want to thank you. Thank you so much for having me here this morning, and I look forward to uh, communicating later on. Thank you so much. Next up, uh, we have Professor Andrew Gordon from Harvard University, the Lee and Julia Folger Fund Professor of History and former director of the Edwin O. Reischauer uh, Institute for Japanese Studies. He's probably uh, the most prominent uh, historian of modern Japan. Uh, today, he's focused on everything from labor class and uh, social and political history uh, of Japan. Uh, with books such as uh, The Evolution of Labor Relations in Japan, uh, Labor and Imperial Democracy in Pre-War Japan, uh, The Wages of Affluence, and his kind of really big kind of uh, overview uh, survey text, A Modern History of Japan, which I believe has been translated also into uh, Japanese uh, and Korean and Chinese too, I think. A, a major work, A Modern History of Japan. But uh, I think interestingly for those of us in the field, uh, in 19, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, just uh, last year, I believe, Asahi uh, Shincho pu published a work that we would never have expected from Andrew Gordon, Nihonjin ga shiranai Matsuzaka Meijia Kakume, roughly translated Matsuzaka's uh, unknown uh, major league uh, revolution. And um, uh, we'd like to ask him to talk about, talk about that and, of course, uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, passion uh, for, for baseball and uh, especially Matsuzaka and, and the city of Boston and the Red Sox. So please help me invite uh, uh, Professor Andrew Gordon. Two tough acts to follow. I kind of wish I'd have been a little earlier in the program and also a, a warm-up for another tough act. I feel very humbled 
and a little bit out of place, not only in speaking on the same panel with two of these great baseball players who've had such important impacts, but also speaking with a colleague of mine who I've known for uh, decades, who's actually done serious work on baseball in Japan and has been working himself for over a decade, written many articles, uh, a book published, another book on the way. Uh, and my own involvement in thinking about and writing about baseball in Japan is pretty um, slim by comparison. So you may ask, why, why did this relatively serious scholar who's written books on labor and management and, 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 and war and peace and those kinds of uh, boring topics decide to write a book about Matsuzaka Daisuke and the Boston Red Sox. Uh, and it basically was something that happened by accident. Uh, in mid-November of 06, just after the Red Sox had posted their amazing bid for Matsuzaka, and begun to negotiate with his agent, Scott Boris, I got a phone call from my friend, Peter Grilly, who is the president of the Japan Society of Boston. He had been working with the Red Sox to advise them on some of the do's and don'ts of negotiating in Japan and you know, getting Matsuzaka to come to Boston. And he was also then helping them out with this recruitment DVD. I don't know if the Giants did a recruitment video for you. Um, and, but this genre now is fairly popular, I guess, um, a 10-minute production that they were putting together to sell. They were going to somehow get it into Daisuke's hands um, without the agent knowing about it. I still don't know how that happened, but um, they managed. Uh, and hoping to sell Boston with image and sound as a great city and the Red Sox as a great team. And Peter suggested I might show up in this uh, production and try to you know, give a sales pitch from the point of view of Harvard. Ah, Daisuke san, Harvard, they mean the matte masio, irashia, irashia. So I went and did a, about a 60 minute pitch like that, standing in front of the John Harvard statue the next day. I mean, who's not going to show up in a, in a production like that? And about a month later, sure enough, Daisuke signed. So I know why he signed. <laughs> Obviously, it was my pitch. The money, well, who cares about money? As you said, it's, it's, the, it's the love of the game. He wanted to come to Boston and hang out with the professors at Harvard. Um, so I told a friend of mine in Tokyo, who Bill Kelly also knows, who is a sports, had been a sports writer for Asahi and now happened to be in their book publishing division. Uh, I sent him an email and said, you know, we were told to keep the existence of this DVD secret, uh, at least until a, a, a bit of time has passed. It's now okay for us to talk about it, so I'm not breaking any deep confidences here today. But um, I told him, you know, I played a secret role in bringing Matsuzaka to Boston, and someday I'll tell you the story when I'm allowed to. And I was joking, of course, so he wrote back and said, hey, why don't you write a book for us? Combine the perspectives of an academic and a fan, and we'll publish it, and we'll get you a press pass. Woo, there's an offer. Not a lot of zeros, not as many zeros after it as, as yours. I earned enough money from this project to buy an HDTV, so it's sort of like a, a busman's holiday, sort of reinvested it into watching more baseball with better quality. But still, it sounded like a great offer, so I signed on, I'll write a book. Chronicle Matsuzaka's first year with the Red Sox, and then I had to figure out what on earth I was going to say. What would be the theme? I hadn't been thinking about it. It had just sort of fallen in my lap. In that sense, it was t totally an accident. But I decided that there was something potentially interesting to say about not only what happened on the field or around the field in a narrow sense, uh, but also to use da Matsuzaka's first season with the Red Sox and people's reactions to that season is a way to talk about how cultures interact and about how both Americans and Japanese use baseball as a way to put out ideas about ourselves and about each other. And so that, you know, in a somewhat abstract way, is what uh, I try to do in the book. And I want to then talk a little bit about that, first from a personal perspective, but of course the other part of this story is that I was a big Red Sox fan, so that was the first reason why I was so excited about showing up in the, in the DVD. Uh, and 
then from the, some of the things I learned in the course of doing this book about the way people build their identities through and around things like sports and in particular baseball. In my own case, the story starts 10 years before I was born actually. This is a kind of an old family story. When my father who was 17 at the time and his brother who was 13, they spent an afternoon in 1942 fly fishing with their own grandfather at a pond about 25 miles west of Boston. Who should they run into but the splendid splinter himself, Ted Williams, the greatest hitter who ever lived, out for an afternoon of fly fishing, something he loved almost as much as hitting fastballs over the green monster. Williams was at the peak of his career. He had batted 406 that uh, uh, two years earlier in 1941, still to be e still unequaled. He had led the league in 1942, had batted 356. He was 25 points above his closest competitor that year. But he had also, that summer of 42, after some criticism that it had taken him that long, he had announced his intent to enlist in the Naval Aviator Corps at the end of the season. So this encounter at the pond took place in that moment, about 10 months after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Japanese Empire stood at its apex. It is odd when you think about it, I had no connection with Japan growing up and this sort of context in this family story that was very much about that moment. The Red Sox fans were very happy by now that Williams had agreed to enlist, but they were also anxious, of course, what his departure would mean for the team. And indeed, he didn't return to the lineup for three years. Now, Williams, as you may know, was very famous for his disdain for the press. He had a very tough relationship with the press. He didn't like the public spotlight. But on this occasion, he was happy enough to make small talk with these two starstruck youths. And the talk turned to his going into the military. And my father asked, so afterwards, will you still play for the Red Sox? Sure, Williams said. I'll play for the Red Sox when I come back. Then his, quid, his kid brother, my uncle, who was kind of a wise guy, said, you mean if you come back? My father was mortified, he says. He just jabbed his brother in the ribs. How can you say something like that? And then William started laughing and said, no, calm down, calm down. That's OK, kids, don't worry. Of course I'm coming back. And he diffused the scene. Well, this is a story that I heard growing up. You don't have to be a professional historian to wonder, is this story true in every detail? I don't know. I wasn't there. But it certainly felt like a true story as I heard it as a kid. It, played a part in confirming, I didn't think about it this way at the time, but later, it confirmed to these grandchildren of immigrants that they were actually Americans who shared the same heroes with their neighbors and their strangers. My, the, the man who took them fishing, uh, my great-grandfather, Ellis, um, had been born to a Jewish family in Russia. He came to the United States at the age of 13 in 1885. He began by selling newspapers and eventually built a small business that, that then grew to be fairly successful making soles of shoes in the Boston Leather District. As chance would have it, he and his wife, when I was a young kid in the uh, late 50s, in their final years, lived in a residential hotel in Kenmore Square in Boston, just a short walk from Fenway Park, where some of the ball players actually at that time lived during the season in this hotel. And I, on one occasion, I saw some of them in the elevator. So, this family story, I tell it in some detail because I think it's probably typical, in, not in the details, but in the general feel of millions of stories of the game of baseball and how it relates to American families. It, baseball that is played a part in turning immigrants into Americans. Each ethnic group had its heroes. Perhaps most famous one was Joe DiMaggio in, of the Yankees, the favorite son of Italians throughout the country. In the 1950s and 60s, of course, baseball also played a role in the efforts of um, America to resolve its shameful heritage of racism and discrimination, beginning, of course, with Jackie Robinson as African Americans were allowed to perform on the major league stage. And then from the 1970s, with players from Latin America and the Caribbean coming into the major leagues in large numbers, often struggling in the face of cultural barriers and language barriers, offering some identification as Americans or with baseball to Hispanic Americans, as well as, of course, to people in their home countries. So that's a kind of background then. Turning to the season that I watched in 2007 at somewhat close range, mostly from the press box, uh, they wouldn't, the Red Sox wouldn't give me a pass actually into the clubhouse 
unfortunately. So I didn't have that much chance to talk to the ball players themselves. Uh, I saw a number of echoes of this identification process in various cases of what you might call body counting. Um, how many players of which ethnicity, how many players of which race or of which nationality were playing, say, overall in the major leagues or for a particular team or on the all-star team? That season, 2007, happened to be the 60th anniversary of Jackie Robinson's de debut in the major leagues, and so there was a lot of celebration about how far we've come in that regard, as well as a lot of concern at the decline in the numbers of African Americans in American baseball. Also during the season, though, there was a hilarious article published of all places in a magazine called American Jewish Life. The title of the article, Why Every American Jew Should Love the Red Sox and Hate the Yankees. The, that large number of, of Jewish players on the 2006 and 7 Red Sox made Jews, quote, proud to be Americans, to be budding young ball players, and to be Jewish. We also saw this kind of identification politics uh, play out in relation to Native Americans in the 07 season with two people. One on the Red Sox, Jacoby Ellsbury, who was the first of the Navajo Nation uh, to play professional baseball in the major leagues. He wasn't the first Native American, but the first from Navajo background. And also, and leave it to the Yankees to come in as well with a, uh, a competing uh, entry in this uh, identification contest, uh, Joba Chamberlain as well. So there were and a lot of then talk and pride about that. But the story, I think, and this is what I want to turn to in the rest of my time, the story in relation to players from Japan or probably Taiwan or Korea is different. And how does that play out? After all, Matsuzaka is not American, and I doubt very much that he'll naturalize or stay on after his career is over. Uh, Although his second child, I, since uh, was was born in the United States, is an American citizen, um, and it's interesting. His family has stayed on in the postseason, as has Okajima's wife and Matsudaka's wife, and kept their child. They didn't want maybe they're just kyoiku mama, but they didn't want their child to miss out on the remainder of the semester of preschool. So they're staying right through the Christmas uh, holiday uh, to keep the children in the preschool. Uh, but still, I don't think in the long run Matsudaka will stay and become. An American. Now, of course, there is a similar sort of pride, though, back in Japan at the presence and the success of a player like Matsuzaka. After all, if there wasn't, they wouldn't have asked me to write the book. The first half of 2007, for instance, saw the first occasion in Major League Baseball history when four Japanese players competed in a single game, two on each team. This happened in a May game that had the Mariners against the Yankees. There was Igawa and Matsui on the Yankees side, and Ichiro and Jojima on the Mariner side. I talked to the veteran announcer from NHK, Kudo Saburo, about this uh, by phone, and he said that nowadays, this isn't much surprise when f for fans or for announcers when two or three Japanese ballplayers appear in one game. He said this sort of, not such a big deal. He said that as a broadcaster, he's trying to shift the focus when he broadcasts major league ball games in Japan away from the particular Japanese players toward the teams they play for. And he suggested that the fans are also making that shift. But I don't think we should exaggerate this shift. Japanese newspapers, as those of you who follow it know, still print the daily lists of the results of every Japanese player in the major leagues as a kind of Japan team box score. Uh, Ichiro, Mat whoever played that day, their line score is there in a row. Uh, which, of course, is not how it happened. That's not an orthodox way to present a box score. Um, and usually in more detail than the results of those teams uh, that they're playing for. But even if, and, and so even if the uh, fact that these four players simultaneously played against each other in this May 2007 game was not a top headline news. Nonetheless, Kudo Saburo was very well aware that that was the first time. He immediately said, oh yeah, this just happened. And all the reporters I spoke to were aware about it. So people were still counting the bodies in that sense, and they still are. This sort of identification issue is still very powerful. Now, I don't want to make too much about this. The point is really that every community, whether it's a community that's defined by its nationality, by its race, by religion, by ethnicity, roots for ballplayers this way. It would be really strange if Japanese 
did not also root for their players in this way. I don't think the Japanese fans are any more obsessed with their players and how they do than other communities are. And in, in some ways, it's probably true, as Kudo suggested, that they're less single-minded in tracking this MLB Japan team as opposed to the individual teams than they were. In that sense, I think this is a dynamic and shifting uh, scene. It's, it's not static. We get, and so now let me talk a bit about Matsuzaka to give you a sense of how he was part of, I think, a shifting landscape in this process of identification that I've been describing that I could see emerging in the 2007 season, especially uh, symbolized in this very strange to me episode that took place midway through the season. That talk, it, it's got to do with the local pride and excitement among Bostonians at the place of the Red Sox, at the hub of what we saw as an increasingly global baseball. That June, midway through the season, the American press started to report that the reaction to Matsuzaka in Japan had cooled off a lot over the first half of the season, partly due to what they felt was his disappointing performance. I mean, the idea that his performance was disappointing is a relative assessment and I think uh, a bit on fair, but if you'd expect him to win every game, then yeah, it was disappointing. He didn't win every game. Uh, so a report in the USA Today newspaper in uh, late June announced, quote, Matsuzaka mania subsides in Japan, and went on to describe in some de detail how people were paying less attention to Matsuzaka. And this provoked a really strange form of pro-Matsuzaka Japan bashing back in Boston. And I listen, I used to listen to NPR when I was a serious intellectual and scholar driving to and from work. Now I listen to talk show, uh, talk sports, sports talk radio, which is a very virulent form of, of, of demagogic uh, expression. In, I don't know if such things exist in, in, the, in the California climate, but certainly in New England. They probably exist here. So I'm listening to WEI on the way home one day, and they're furious. They're talking about this USA Today article, and people are calling in, and then the announcers are, what's wrong with the people over there? Don't they understand how hard it is to adjust to a new league? Why are they so hard on Matsuzaka? Can't they see what a fantastic job he's doing? What do they expect? Do they think he's supposed to pitch a no-hitter every day? So they were furious. And to me, it was a remarkable combination of insularity and internationalism sort of wrapped up together. These Red Sox nation citizens seem to be saying, we appreciate our Matsuzaka, we appreciate Japanese ballplayers more than people in Japan. They were using Matsuzaka, or I should say, I suppose we were using Matsuzaka, to confirm ourselves as internationalists as global citizens. That was how we could sort of build a sense of not narrow ethnic pride, but sort of, oh, Bostonians are now global people because we love Matsuzaka more than people in Japan. <coughs> but so that was one really interesting part of the sort of Boston adoption of Daisuke. But of even more interest or about equal interest to me, and this is the last point I'll make, was the reaction back in Japan through, because I put this episode in the book, to this, so the Japanese reaction to this American reaction to the cooling off of the Matsuzaka fever in Japan. This sort of like ping pong bouncing back and forth across the Pacific Ocean of perceptions. The two pages in the book that tell this episode have been the ones that the readers and the bloggers and the reviewers have commented on, on more than any other single place in the book. Now that might, part, it was on the obi, the, the, the cover, Asahi put this uh, Oranga Matsuzaka, our Matsuzaka, uh, they put a little tease to that anecdote on the obi. So if you're cynical you think, well nobody actually read the book, they only read the obi, so that's why they all comment on this episode. But I think even actually some of the people who read the whole thing um, were struck by it. Why did they really like this story? of how the people in Boston got so upset that the people in Japan weren't enough appreciating Daisuke. I think it touches, and here I'm interested in you, some of your reactions, uh, uh, both my other panelists and also the audience. 
I think it touches on a deep insecurity among people in Japan as they look at the United States in particular and then the world in general about how we are, we Japanese are regarded. Are we really accepted? Are we really liked? And so an episode like this is a kind of way to get a sense of that. And it suggests to me that even while the fans in Japan are excited at the success of their players on the baseball field in the United States, which confirms to the extent that an Ichiro or a Matsui or a, or a Jojima or a Matsuzaka or Okajima, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do well, it, it suggests that at its highest levels, Japanese baseball is played at a global standard. And that's a very gratifying thing. But also, this sort of personal acceptance that their players are liked and understood and embraced is, I think, terribly important to people in Japan as a way to sort of address some of this insecurity. So with that as a thought, and I'll be really interested to hear your comments and reactions, let me end my comments. And again, thank you very much. Uh, I know there must be, at this point, after Crow and uh, Professor Gordon and Professor Kelly questions, but we've got one final uh, speaker uh, with us today um, before Matsuzaka, uh, before Ichiro, before Nomo, the first uh, Japanese to play in Major League Baseball, uh, Mr. Uh, Masanori Murakami, uh, known to many of us as uh, Mashi. But uh, um, one moment, please. Um, Mr. Murakami joined uh, the Japanese professional baseball um, uh, right uh, from high school, uh, joining the Nankai Hawks, and, but, but was almost immediately uh, um, uh, sent to the United States as a so-called exchange student uh, with the San Francisco Giants. And uh, to learn something from the American system, uh, was sent to San Francisco Giants single A team in Fresno. And I don't think at that time anybody expected he would be uh, pitching for uh, in the major leagues, but uh, his uh, amazing range of pitches from the uh, screwball changeup to curve, he, he uh, was striking out batters and he moved up uh, in September to, uh, 1964 uh, to play uh, for the first time uh, for the San, San Francisco Giants. And uh, not only was he uh, a great pitcher during that, uh, his, his time with the San Francisco Giants, especially as a reliever, but uh, in the context of our discussions today, he generated, of course, a big buzz in Japan, but also a big buzz here in the San Francisco Bay Area among uh, Japanese and Japanese Americans uh, here in, in California. Up on the wall uh, back there, we actually have some photographs that Mr. Murakami kindly lent to us, we kind of blew them up a little bit, of his uh, meetings with uh, members of the Japanese American community, Japanese American uh, baseball clubs, I think some of the, I think the Berkeley Bears, uh, uh, Japanese American uh, baseball uh, teams for youth here, and he very much immersed himself in, in the uh, community. In 1966, he re returns uh, to the Hawks and, uh, and uh, pitches uh, for the Hawks, but also um, uh, in different uh, periods of time for the Hanshin Tigers and the Nippon Ham Fighters. Um, and in his post-playing uh, career, uh, has served as a pitching coach for uh, uh, Nippon Ham Fighters, uh, Fukuoka Dai Hawks, uh, Sabre Lions, and then uh, in more recent times has also served as a commentator on baseball, um, uh, Japanese baseball, but also with the NHK um, uh, Major League uh, baseball coverage. So today, uh, Mr. Murakami will, will speak about his time in the major leagues, uh, as well as the challenges of being a pioneer uh, Japanese in the league. And we'll speak in Japanese, and I'm, we'll have uh, Beth Carey, our trusted translator, uh, do the translation. And um, uh, please, please help me welcome, really, uh, a legend, the first Japanese player to play in the major league baseball, Mr. Murakami Masanori. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I can speak uh, not so much uh, English, then uh, I need a translator. Then, uh, uh, anyway, uh, just one over here. I, uh, 1964, March 10, I fly the uh, uh, Panam DC-8 uh, from the Haneda, fly to the Haneda to San Francisco. Then 
uh, that time uh, start my life. Then uh, ne next is uh, I talk to Japanese. え、高校はあの名門の甲子園で優勝しました法政2校に入りました。え、入って野球部に入ったわけなんですけど、え、私が3年の夏もうあの大会も終わりまして、家でえ、ま、夏休みをしていた時にですね、え、当時の南海ホ
Um, <clears throat> uh, so um, uh, I uh, would uh, try to save money by hitchhiking into town uh, to buy um, uh, things. Um, and uh, at the end of March, uh, when um, payday came around, I thought I would uh, get paid. Uh, in Japan, uh, uh, we get paid every month uh, from January through December all year long um, as baseball players. I didn't know the system in America. Uh, and the payday came, but no money came. Uh, so I felt kind of miserable as my money uh, started disappearing. Um, and I didn't know who to ask about um, uh, whether I should get paid, but I realized that nobody <laughs> was getting paid uh, on that uh, team. Uh, so um, I was feeling uh, rather desolate. Okay. And I was a minor in baseball, and I was very happy to be here. On the 8th of July, the owner came and said, I'm going to go to the major, and I'm going to go to the major. And I'm going to go to the major, and I'm going to go to the United Airlines halfway ticket. そし,そしてニューヨークのルズベルトホテルこのアドレスを教えてくれましてこれで行ってくれということで、まあ、あの喜んではいたんですそしてフレズノからプロペラですねプロペラでサンフランシスコのエアポートに行って、まあ、ここはホームチームのところですから球場までもう15分ぐらいのところですから誰か来ていてくれるなと。日本だったら来ていてくれるんですけど、誰もいないんです。さあ困った。えー、何しろ、えー、アメリカという国は広い国だし、これからニューヨークへ行かねゃいけない。シエスタジアムですね。えー、それで、えー、何しろ聞くのは、一番間違いないのはパイロット。で、ユニフォーム着たパイロットに、私はニューヨークへ行くんだけど、どこ行ったらいいんだ。あそこのゲート行きなさい。そしてまた、えー、フライトして、えー、ケネディ空港着きました。ところが、誰もいないんです。さあ、また困りまして、えー、またパイロットに来ましたね。ルーズベルトホテルへ行くにはどうしたらいいんだと。えー、そして、あの、リムチに乗りなさいということで、荷物を持って、えー、ホテルチェックインしに行ったんです。やれやれと思ってたどり着いたホテル、ルーズベルトホテルのカウンターに来まして、えー、私の、えー、私は、マスノリ村神だと,と言いますと、ホテルの、まあ、男がですね、お前の名前はないよと。はて困ったなもう一回見てくれてないいやー弱っちゃったなでフレズの出る時にですね、えー、まあ,あ佐伯さんがですね、えー、気をつけなさいよニューヨークは怖いですよとその時にとっさに思ったのは俺は明日ハドソン川に浮かんでるんじゃないかなとそんな気持ちをしました、えー、ホテルのロビーのですねソファーに20分か30分座ってましたけどそれがもう1時間以上待ってるような気がしたんですけど、まあ、その後に、えー、ト,ラえー、とトラベルのセクラでですね、来まして、お前がジャパニーズピッチャーかということで、無事にチェックインされました。On August 30th,、uh, I was told by the、uh, minor、uh, league team owner um, uh, that um, I was、uh, promoted to the majors.、Uh, and、uh, this is something I'd been dreaming of. Uh, but uh, I needed to、um, get to New York. I was given a ticket、uh, that I, I was I, going to New York, and I was told to go to the Roosevelt Hotel in New York. I was very happy about this. I took the propeller plane from Fresno to San Francisco, and since San Francisco was the home of the San Francisco Giants, and it was only about 15 minutes to their baseball park,、um, I thought. That there would be somebody who would meet me there to get me onto the plane for New York safely, but nobody was there. And I felt、uh, kind of dejected uh, having uh, nobody to、um, help me.、Uh, and I thought, well, who can I rely on? And I thought, somebody in a uniform would be good.、Uh, so I、uh, found a pilot who was in his pilot's uniform, and I asked him how to get to the gate to go to New York.、Uh, and he told me where to go. Uh, when I arrived in New York, there was nobody there to meet me,、um, and I knew I needed to go to the Roosevelt Hotel, so somehow I got myself、uh, to the Roosevelt Hotel uh, and asked um, at, the reser- at the front desk、um, if there was a reservation for、uh, Masanori Murakami. And the、uh, clerk looked, he said, There's nobody by that name on my list. I said, Please look again. 
and he said, no, no one, no one by that name on the list. Uh, I had heard that New York was a dangerous place, and I thought, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to me here? Am I just going to be left alone in this uh, dangerous place? Uh, I waited for 20 or 30 minutes um, uh, in the lobby, um, and it seemed like I was waiting for over an hour. Uh, finally, the traveling secretary of the team came uh, and made sure uh, that I got checked in. So that was my start of go going to be in the majors. えー、そして9月の1日、私はあの CA スタジアムでえサインをしまして、そのゲームがですね、ちょうど4対0で負けていたんです。その7回の裏にですね、もし8回に点が入らなければ、まし、お前が行くぞという電話をブルペンにえでもらいまして、私はすぐにウォーミングアップ始めました。そしてえー、まあ,あ私にとっては運が良かったと思うんですよ点が入らないで8回の裏に、えー、まあ,あ私が登板することになったんですけどその時に、えー、Now pitching number ten 正則村上こういうアナウンスされたんですね、えー、それで私はちょうどレフト側のブルペンから、えー、フェンスのドアを開けてですね、えー、入ってき、えー、たんですけど今までフレーズのとこはサルナスとかスタクトンとかいろんなところでゲームやったんですけど多分200人とか300人400人そのくらいのお客さんがいなかったんですところがその日は4万人です40000 people <笑>で maybe、えー、私はもう like this <笑>あの afraid、うん、なるんじゃないかなと思ってでとっさにこう歩きながらスタンドを見たときにあそうだ気持ちを落ち着かせるためには何がいいかなと思ったときにはとっさに思いついたのがすき焼きソングあの当時、えー、流行っていた坂本九の上を向いて歩こうですねそれを私は、えー、ハミングしながらマウンドに向かっていったんですでマウンドに向かっていって、えー、まあ,あその自分の気持ちをね、えー、落ち着かせて、えーウォーミングアップに入ったわけです。はい uh, on uh, September 1st,、um, I,、uh, we were、um, playing、um, a baseball game against the Mets,、uh, and、um, uh, the、uh, score was、uh, 4 to 0、uh, at the bottom of the seventh.、Uh, and I was told that if、uh, no、uh, scores are made on, in the eighth inning, then I would be sent in.、Uh, so I was warming up in the bullpen. Uh, for me, fortunately,、uh, there was、uh, no、um, runs were、um, uh, made,、uh, so I was、uh, told to、uh, pitch. So I heard the announcement、uh, now pitching number 10, Masanori Murakami, and、uh, I left the left bullpen,、uh, opened the fence、uh, gate, and entered the field. Uh, I had been、uh, pitching in Fresno and other small towns around、uh, California、uh, to uh, the audiences of、um, 200 or 400 people, and this was 40,000 people、uh, in the stands.、Uh, so I became very nervous, <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm so afraid.、Um, uh, I need to calm down. What shall I do to calm myself down? And、uh, what popped into my mind was、uh, the sukiyaki song, Ue o Muite Aruko, which、uh, in Japanese the, the words are look up and walk to kind of、um, have a positive feeling,、uh, no, don't get depressed type of song.、Uh, so I hummed that to myself as I went up to the pitcher's mound、uh, to calm myself down. So, this is the first time I've えー、フレズノの佐伯さん家族ですね、えー、私がフレズノあのアリゾナからフレズノ行った時に、えー、私は家を探してましたところが給料が出なくてもう持ってるお金も200ドルぐらい、えー、それで、えー、私はあのバンコブ東京に行きまして持っていた2万円をワンダラーで400円で買えてですね、えー、それはそうとどっか住まいがないですかねと尋ねたそして近所のところに行ってこの部屋いいんじゃないかなという話をしていたところに、えー、ハワード佐伯、えー、が私とちょうど同じ年なんですけど彼が来て「ユーラー何してんの?」と言ったんで「私はこうだ」と「家を探してるんだ」と「住むとこを探してるんだ」と言ったらあハワードハウイですね
ハウイがあの家に電話をしまして、マミ、えー、ジャパニーズピッチャーがホームステイした,いしたいと言ったら OK だということで、えー、私は喜んで、えー、そこに、えー、あのなんていうんですかね、えー、下宿させてもらいまして、おかげでね、えー、非常にそのマイナーリーグの時にはあ、いろいろボールパークまで送り迎えしてもらったりして、やっぱりここまで来れたのは、あ佐伯さんご夫婦そしてハウイのおかげだと思っているもう彼らはもうパスダウェイですがね、えー、亡くなっているんで、まあ、あの感謝の気持ちと冥福を祈っています。Uh, one of the reasons I could、um, uh, get that far、uh, was due to the Saiki family. Uh, I had only a small amount of money, and as I was changing some money at the Bank of Tokyo、uh, and wondering where I could live,、um, I met Howard Saeki,、uh, who um, uh, listened to、uh, my story about、uh, my concerns um, about um,、uh, being in America, and he said, Okay. And he called his mother up and said, Mom, I, can you uh, have. Uh, Uh, a Japanese pitcher who's here,、uh, homestay、uh, with you. And、uh, his mother、uh, okayed that, so I was able to live with the Saeki family.、Um, and they drove me to and from the ballpark.、Uh, and it's uh, really um, thanks to them. Uh, they, uh, both the parents and Howard have passed away now, but it,、um, I really still have、uh, grateful feelings uh, toward them、um, uh, that I was able to、uh, start off in the United States. えー、それで、えー、まあ、あのー、メッツのマウンドに上がりまして、さあ、プレイボール変わりました。非常に私は、あの、気持ちが落ち着いていたんです。えー、トップバッターはチャーリー・スミスという人。今、私の家には、その、彼のベースボールカードがあります。えー、そして、えー、トム・ハラーのサインが、ファーストボールのアウトサイドコーナー。ということで、私は渾身の力を込めて、第1球を投げました。えー、見事にアウトサイドコーナーのストライク、これで私はもう非常に気持ちが楽になりまして、えー、チャーリー・スミスをストラックアウトにしました、で次のバッター、名前忘れましたけど、えーえー、センターの方にベースヒットを打たれたんですけど、ネクストヒッターをまたストラックアウトして、えー、次のヒッターはインフィールドゴロで、えー、見事に、えーまあ、自分なりに、えー、素晴らしいデビューができたんじゃないかなと、ワンヒットですけど、ツーストライクアウトを取って、えー、まあデビューしたわけなんですけど、まああのー、この時にですね、えー、私は投げた時にはそんなに感激はなかったんですで次の日の朝起きてニューヨーク・タイムズ見たんですそしたらニューヨーク・タイムズに私今家にあのその新聞がありますけど、えー、ファースト・ジャパニーズピッチャー正則村上デビューサムシンって書いてあったそれを見てお私はなんかものすごくどでかいことをしたんじゃないかなということが急に思い出しなんか感激というのがね出てきてえちょっと私も頭の方が鈍いのか分かりませんけどえ一晩してからえその感激が湧いてきました。So、uh, with a play ball uh, I uh, uh, was a pitching Uh, to um, uh, the top batter, Charlie Smith. I still have his baseball card.、Uh, and the catcher, Tom Haller,、um, gave me the signal for a,、um, a fastball on the out- in the outside corner.、Uh, so I was able to throw exactly what was asked. And、um, then I heard the、uh, call saying strike. And、uh, then the next bat,、uh, so I was able to strike、um, Charlie Smith out. And、uh, for that inning, I was able to do two strikes,、uh, strikeouts and allowed only、uh, one hit.、Uh, so I thought myself I did a decent uh, debut, um, uh, but I wasn't、uh, that really aware of, of,、uh, of my own feelings. The next morning, I saw in the New York Times、um, a uh, headline saying, uh, one uh, article headline saying,、uh, the first Japanese pitcher. Uh, Masanori Murakami uh, debuted, uh, and I, then I realized I must have done something really great.、Uh, I might be a little dim, but it was only、uh, the next day that I realized、uh, what had actually happened. So, I was in the middle of the day, and I was in the middle of the day, and I was in the middle of the day, and I was in the 
まあ、一番私にとっては大きな出来事おというかあったんですけど、えー、ロサンゼルスドジャースタジアムで、えー、ある日投げたんですねで私は、えー、自信持ってストライクだと思ったあミドルの低めのところに決まったファーストボールがアンパイアがボールって言ったんですで初めて私はクレームをつけました23歩歩いていって「ワイ!」って言ったらアンパイアが早口でベベッ私には分かりませんもう半分諦めちゃってそして後ろへもうすごすごね歩いていってマウンドに、えー、こう行きまして、えー、行ったらところで、えー、足元に老人バックってあのピッチャーの老人バックって言ったら分かるかな、うんえー、それを大きいんですよユナイテッドステイズのはでそれをですねバックスクリーンを見ながら私は拾って上の方に投げたんです。でもう天井に着くくらいのところまでボーンそして、えー、私はふっと一息ついてじゃあ投げようかと思ってホームプレートの方を見たらアンパイアがそこまで来てるんですねでキャッチャーはジャック・ハイアットで、えー、彼が一生懸命こう抱きかかえてるんですよアンパイアがなんだかんだっていろんなことを言うんですで私に対して私が要するにクレームをつけたオーバーアクションしたもんですから怒っちゃってるんですところがジャック・ハイエットは一生懸命、の彼はジャパニーズピッチャーで日本あのアメリカのことよくわからないんだから勘弁してやってくれって一生懸命言ってるんですよ。そして私のそばに来て、いいか、帰るときに、いいかお前、もう一回やってみろ、退場だぞ、と言って、まあ、引き上げていったんです。Uh, and、uh, one of the major events,、uh, that, most impressive events、uh, to me that I remember uh, is um, uh, during um, a game against the Dodgers、uh, in Los Angeles.、Uh, and I thought I had pitched、uh, a fastball right down the middle, and I thought it was a strike,、uh, but the、uh, umpire called it a ball.、Uh, so I couldn't understand. How he could have done that. So I、uh, took a few steps and said,、uh, yelled at the umpire. I said, Why?、Um, uh, to complain to the umpire.、Um, and um, uh, then I walked back, and then he spoke very fast to me uh, what uh, the answer <laughs> as to my question, why. And I couldn't understand what he said. So I walked back to the pitcher's mound uh, and um, uh, picked up the rosin bag. And the American rosin bags are really large. Uh, and threw it up into the air.、Um, and uh, then, um, then, when I turned <coughs> around to, do my next, to throw my next pitch,、um, uh, the umpire had come almost all the way up to the pitcher's mound、um, and was、uh, yelling at me.、Uh, and went with the catcher, Jack Hyatt,、um, pulling him、uh, back. Uh, saying, he doesn't understand. He's Japanese. He doesn't understand English. Please forgive him, <laughs> you know,、uh, trying to really、uh, help me out that way.、Uh, so finally, um, uh, the umpire said,、uh, if you do that once more,、uh, I'll kick you out of the game. Uh, so uh, that was a, a, a kind of a major、uh, event that happened、uh, in that time. えー、そしてですね、えーまあ、ゲームは無事に終わって、えー、私はサンフランシスコ帰りました、えー、数日後ですね、えー、ジャパンのジャパンあのサンフランシスコダウンタウンの大和す,すき焼きですかね、えー、そこへ私はあの友達と食事に行ったんですそしたら、えー、その時、えー、日系の,その1世2世ですねそういう人たちがいっぱい来てます長老がですね、えー、おじいさんが私を見たらあいきなり寄ってきてね、村上さんって言うんですよ。で私の手を取るんですね。うん、私はじゃただハローっていう感じだったんですけど、いやー村上さんもよくやってくれたと。なんでしょうかと言ったら、いやユウはこれしたろと。テレビでもうあの放送してるわけです。それを見てたんですよね。でなんこれして私は退場になりそうだったら。なんで喜んでるのかなと思ったら、えー、やっぱりこれは。あの要するに太平洋戦争第二次世界大戦でですね日系の一世二世の方が財産を没収されたり収容所に入れられたりしてそれで負けちゃったその後戦後ですね非常にその日系人の人が苦しんだで私はその国技のベースボールで
、ね、あの 4, 4万の5万の監視の中でボーンってやっちゃったわけですよプロレスとかそういうあの小的なもんじゃなくて真剣勝負やってるところでやっちゃったもんですからその,あの長老がですねいやーよくやってくれた私たちは戦後ねもう、えー、と19年ぐらい経った時かなもうあの一般の趣味になったけど決してそのアメリカ人に対してね逆らうことできなかったんだよとでも胸の中非常に仕えていたとでも君がそれを国技の中でバンってやってくれたそのおかげで私の胸の使いが全部取れちゃったということでね私はなんかえらいところであの貢献したなとなんか変な気持ちになりましたよだけどやっぱりですねまあ今も戦争いっぱいやってますけどその時私思いましたまああの日本とアメリカが戦争してねこうやっていろんな人たちが苦しんできたとこういうことをやっぱり二度と戦争ってのはやっちゃいけないその時非常に思いましたね So the game ended. I went back to San Francisco.、Uh, a few days later, I、uh, went to eat at, I think it was Yamato Sukiyaki,、um, with、uh, some friends. And、uh, there were、um, quite a few Ise and Nise、uh, at the restaurant.、Uh, and these,、um, some elder Japanese Americans、uh, came up to me and really shook my hand very warmly、uh, and said,、um, You really did it. You really did a great thing for us. Uh, and I was wondering what、um, they were talking about.、Uh, but then I realized that uh, during uh, World War II,、uh, Japanese Americans had、uh, suffered greatly,、uh, their、uh, belongings, their houses uh, taken uh, from them uh, and uh, put into internment camps.、Uh, and、um, what I had protested in a real、uh, win or lose situation, I had uh, uh, spoken up and uh, protested uh, to uh, the American umpire. Um, during uh, the game. Uh, and um, even though it was、uh, around about 19, 20 years、uh, since、uh, the end of the war, these people had felt that they couldn't say no or couldn't go against、uh, the Americans. Um, and um, what I had done had really、uh, made them feel、uh, just a, a kind of a, a, a relief uh, at uh, this kind of、uh, opposition. Uh, to Americans. And it wasn't as if I was、uh, making a real protest statement. I was just annoyed at that moment. But somehow I had contributed to、uh, the Japanese Americans and uh, their um, uh, feelings as well.、Uh, and it made me realize uh, that um, uh, the war uh, that uh, Japan and the US uh, had um, uh, Uh, entered into um, uh, caused many people、uh, to suffer,、uh, and that、um, we should never、uh, get into a war situation again. So, I was in the season of 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 the season. えー、でもいい給料だったんじゃないかな、えー、15,000 ダラーの最初の提示が私その今コントラクト持ってますあここにはないです家にあの2部持ってるんですねそして、えー、いやーって話しているうちに最後は3万ドルもなりました30000ダラーそして、えー、マイペアレンツをインバイトしてくれるといういろいろな話があったんです私の気持ちは非常にアメリカでやりたかった。もうオーバーハンドレッパーセンテージ、こちらでプレイしたかったんです。ところが、私は、えー、人間的な考え方でしたときには、えー、確かに私はこっちで、私がする,する気になればできたんです。ところが、えー、私が入団するときに、あの鶴岡監督が私の家に来て、村上君、何回と契約すれば、アメリカに野球留学。この留学っていうのは勉強ですよね。アメリカのベースボールを勉強して帰ってきてくれという、そのことが頭の中にあったわけです。で、私は、えー、やむなく、鶴岡さんとの約束を守るために、えー、3年目には、えー、まあ、あ泣く泣く、日本の方で、えー、帰ってプレーしたわけなんですけど、今思えばですね、あの時に鶴岡さんが、まし、お前、まだアメリカでやってもいいよと言ってくれれば喜んでやったんです
それが、えー、私のいつもの講演の中では我が人生に悔いはありと言うんですで両方取ることはできないわけですよねだけど今本当に思うとあれからまだまだ21歳ですからもっともっとプレーできたと思うんですよできるだけプレーして5年か6年もっとやってみたかったなというその、えー、私はあ私の一度っきりないこの人生の中で非常に大きな悔いは残ってますだけども私は非常にアメリカの人たちに親切にしてもらって、えー、そういう面では悔いのない、えー、また人生を送っているんじゃないかと思って私の今日の話に変えさせていただきますありがとうございます Uh, so,、uh, for the third year,、um, I, was, um, a- I、uh, received a contract. So, initially, it was、uh, $15,000.、Uh, but um, as uh, the, this third year contract、um, uh, was going to be for $30,000, and I thought that was a pretty good、uh, sum. Um, and I really wanted to stay and play、uh, in America for the major leagues. And I realized that I was able to play in the major leagues and I was having success.、Uh, so it would have been a wonderful、uh, chance for me to continue、uh, in the US.、Uh, but、um, I recalled the promise I had uh, made uh, with、um, uh, manager uh, Tsuruoka. Uh, in Japan,、uh, that、uh, my coming to the US was to study abroad and to take back what I had learned、uh, in the US to Japan to、um, make the team in Japan stronger. Uh, so, uh, to fulfill my obligation to、um, uh, Manager Tsuruoka, I returned to Japan. But if he had said, Mashi, you can stay in the US, you can play in the US, I would have.、Uh, Uh, not hesitated at all, and I would have stayed in the US to play.、Uh, I often say in the talks that I give that I have no regrets、uh, for the life I have led.、Um, but I was only 21 years old, and I could have played、uh, longer、uh, in the US, I think. So that is the one major regret I have in my life.、Uh, but I really do、uh, recall the kindness uh, uh, that was、uh, given to me by Americans uh, and um, that. Uh, I had a wonderful chance、uh, to play here. So I, ultimately, I don't have any regrets. Thank you.、Uh, we have today that, those photographs on the, on the wall there of Mr. Murakami、uh, meeting with、uh, members of the Japanese American community here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And、um, I think we have Ken Sano in the room.、Uh, one of the pictures shows Min Sano, the son of Min Sano, is here. I believe、um, we also have,、um, uh, you know, among the Berkeley Bears that are in that particular photograph, everybody has passed away except one,、uh, Joseph Yatabe. And I believe he's,、uh, he's with us here today. So, after our question and answer, we're going to have a moment to、um, uh, have, we have、uh, sushi and beer, of all things, but、um, uh, light refreshments before the Cal football game. But this is our moment to、um, ask our, our guests some、um, questions. I'm going to, though, first ask、uh, a key person that really helped us put this event together,、um, uh, Mr. Jack Sakazaki. He's the CEO of a major、uh, Jap- Japan- Japanese、uh, sports marketing、uh, firm. And,、uh, and has over the decades brought、uh, just the m- most important、uh, major sports、uh, figures as well as organized major、um, uh, sports events in tennis, football,、uh, soccer,、uh, as well as baseball, and over the years has、uh, represented Japanese、uh, players as well as brought、uh, major leaguers to,、uh, to Japan. Cal, uh, uh, Jack is a Cal alum. And、uh, I think the fir- first Japanese American to play on the Cal football team and、uh, is the head of our、um, uh, J- uh, Cal Alumni Association in Japan. And so、um, uh, he's the one that actually brought、uh, 
uh, Mr. Cromarty and uh, Mr. Murakami together for this event. So I wanted to just acknowledge and thank him and maybe ask him to come up and, and start us off uh, in our question and answer and then open it up to all of you to, to uh, ask these distinguished panelists uh, some questions. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, it's an honor for me and a great pleasure to be uh, back here in Berkeley. Uh, I went to graduate, uh, undergraduate school in 1966 to 71. I was an architectural student. For some reason, I decided to um, go to Japan, uh, study a little bit of Japanese architecture, but I decided that, that wasn't the field I wanted to be in, and I got involved in the sports marketing. And I've been in it since 1974 in the sports business. And um, because I was involved in representing Major League Baseball in Japan from year two, uh, 1990 to 2002, way before uh, Nomo came to Japan, much after Masi played in uh, San Francisco, uh, I was able to meet many of the Major League uh, people, uh, the players, and at the same time, I had, uh, after 2002, I started to represent many players in Japan. So I rep represented many of the Japanese uh, baseball players, tennis, golf, soccer, as well as uh, representing many uh, sports events uh, in Japan and Europe and Asia. But in any case, um, when Duncan Williams, Professor Williams asked me that he wanted to do something in sports uh, for this 50th uh, anniversary, of the Asian studies, I said, well, the baseball probably would be the best, uh, which would, uh, uh, that both nations uh, love uh, very much. And uh, because I knew Mr. Murakami and Mr. Kromati for many years, and I knew that these two individuals really changed uh, baseball for both countries, that it was appropriate for uh, a university to bring them here to have them give us a, a talk. But anyway, uh, I don't want to talk about what I've done, but uh, today is a baseball uh, discussion, and uh, I wanted to ask a few questions, but both of them already gave the answers to my questions, so <laughs> there isn't much for me to ask. Uh, the one thing is, in the, maybe you're not aware, but Warren Cromati, in one season, batted 378 average for a season. Uh, I think it was 1989. 1989. This record of 375 is a record that still stands in Japanese baseball. Uh, oh, at the time, it was a, 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 the record in the 70 years history of Japanese baseball. Uh, has it been broken by Ichiro? Ichiro, yeah. Ichiro uh, since broke that record. But in any case, <laughs> he, he, he changed. I mean, I was there when he played in Japan. Uh, he made watching baseball, a fun affair. You know, every time he was on base, he would give us bonsai, bonsai with the big eyes, and you know, it was a great times. And also for me, I grew up in Fresno, California. And I was a high school boy when Masi first came to Fresno to pitch. So for us, Nisei, Sanseis, and Isseis, it was such a pride for us to have a Japanese playing in America. So we went to see him play in Fresno. In fact, I saw him pitch the last game that he played in Fresno, two hitter, two to one to win, and thereafter he was called up to the majors. So me, for me to have two of my good friends <coughs> to be here today at Berkeley and my university, it's, it's a great pleasure. Anyway, I was gonna ask a question, but I think it's better that you guys ask whatever question you may have to the, the players. え、uh, those days, uh, to uh, everybody in Japan was interested in the Tokyo Olympics uh, that were uh, to take place in 1964. Uh, so uh, the um, 
uh, news uh, organizations um, were focused on that much more uh, than on um, any uh, player playing in the U.S. Uh, I think the article, so in terms of television, I don't think there is any coverage, uh, but in terms of um, small articles in the newspapers, of course, uh, that uh, was um, uh, done, uh, but um, nothing like front page news that um, is uh, uh, done for the current uh, players uh, in the U.S. So I think it was a much more smaller effort. Thank you. Is there a question? Yes.え、私の時はあの、いませんでしたけどね。え、私の後に来たのがノモですね。え、30年後です。で、ノモが入った時には通訳がつきました。あ、だから非常に彼らはその、ベースボールしやすかったんじゃないかと思いますけど、ま、
to do what they did, not to try to stand out so much. I was in the newspaper whether I did bad or good every day. So my thing is to bring my game from America to Japan and try to blend it to make it work. So I was never, I never considered myself somebody above anybody. I was, I was trying to be equal. I wanted to do what the Japanese do. I wanted to eat the food. I wanted to, like I said earlier, the Shikansen. So it was very important to be successful in any foreign language, or not a foreign language, a foreign country, another country. The most important thing you have to learn to do is to learn how to adapt. It's a lot of ball players that came into Japan that weren't very successful because they wanted to try to do something different. They tried to rock the boat. They didn't want to do this, they didn't want to do that, and they let their pride get in the way. Me, this is all about blending in. And uh, to the stands, to your friend there, I tell him I appreciate that a lot, and um, you know, it's, at least I left something for him to remember me by. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the question is, um, <coughs> uh, for example, uh, Okajima, when he was with uh, the Giants, uh, his uh, main ball was a curve ball. Uh, but he went, when he came to the U.S., he was able to uh, learn how to do change-ups. Uh, the ball size is different, the seams are different, etc. So, uh, so in terms of the technical aspect, uh, what kind of differences uh, did you uh, face? This time I talked to English. <laughs> Little bit. The Okajima is, uh, he, uh, he played the uh, Giants before. Then Giants uh, coach uh, said and his, his form is not so good because he not see the home plate. They go like this. Then the coach said, no, no, you better watch in the catcher, Smith, then the throw, but he cannot pitch. Then he traded the Nippon Ham fighters. The fighters pitch coach, okay. Coach said, don't care. <laughs> then he throw the go like this. Then uh, he pitched uh, uh, very good uh, Nippon Ham fighters, then a uh, uh, free agent to move to the Boston, but uh, uh, Okajima had already the change up. Yes, you know, like this and the change up. Then, uh, like a fork ball, the outside corners go down. Then, uh, you know, every hitter is uh, thinking his form is uh, go like this. Then, but the uh, arm is then comes. Maybe timing is different. Then he does swing. His uh, first ball maybe uh, what uh, 80, uh, 88, 88 maybe, not so fast. But he does cannot hit. Maybe this much mistake. You know the, his form is very different. You know uh, before normal is a you know, tornado. His form is different. Then he had a, a good folk ball in Japan too. You know every year. The, most winner, 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 struck out. But Okajima is almost the same. The players, uh, what's say the, I don't know. So if a, a player has uh, something unique that he has uh, and is able to uh, work out with that and to stress that, then he'll succeed. あの、私の場合はですね、え、ま、日本に帰ってからはなそファースト。ビコズアイアイメイキングザマスルでなナッシャープ。バットアイハブザ、え、オーバーヒアザ、え、フレズの then uh, I have the fastball and the curveball. Then a uh, uh, little bit screwball. Then, uh, you know, every, every hitter is thinking uh, after two balls, maybe uh, throw the fastball, but I can throw the curveball. Then I get strike. 
strike. Then a uh, pitch over here, the fast ball, and sometimes run on the fast base and throw school ball, and then the ground ball, and double play. Yes. Then uh, uh, I was here every time. Uh, you know, the Cookie Rabadetto is a third base coach at that time. He said, hey, Mashi, I, we went to the St. Louis. Mashi, let's go to the luncheon party. What? Oh, yes, Stan Musial's luncheon party. Okay, I go. I go to together. Then uh, I didn't know the Stan Musial before. Then uh, who is he? He's a former player. Then, okay, may I have an autograph, please? <laughs> Yeah, then always, all the time I, I go to, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, American players and uh, uh, another, you know, go to somewhere. Okay, okay, let's go. Then one day, one day, Uri Mates called to his house. Me and Harlania and uh, Latin American uh, players, they invite us to the home party. Then uh, Uri called, hey, much come on. He taking uh, his bedroom. Then uh, uh, he, you know, uh, opened uh, his uh, tansu, uh, chest, Clo cabinet, like closet, like right? mm -hmm. then, uh, then picking up, oh, Mashi, take this one. He gave to me the cow's bottom. Yes, I got in Japan now. Then he's very good man. All, anyway, uh, he's uh, 13 years older than me, but same days. Birthday, oh. May 6th. Yeah. Yes. And uh, one more, one more. Uh, you know the Ingawa, Yankees players? Uh, he's, uh, I think, he's a good player in Japan, but he cannot so good over here because I never talk to the, in the dugout, talk to somebody. Only one time talk to Matsui Hideki. Uh, some kind said that every time watching like this, home run, struck out, nothing. You know, if I'm the home run, oh, go, 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 struck out, oh, damn, like this. <laughs> but he's nothing, just, it's not, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> question that is uh, concerning the annual schoolboy tournaments in Japan. Um, I spent uh, seven years in the 70s and 80s living over there, and I was struck by how much these two tournaments, I think uh, Haru no Tokito, Aki no Tokito, where it was, spring and fall in Japan captivate the nation. They're on television, they're you know, in the newspapers, and everybody just stops their life and watches these tournaments. So my question is twofold. Why is it so popular in Japan? And secondly, is this ever going to happen in the United States in a schoolboy level term? Maybe Professor Kelly? Yeah. Well, to a certain extent, the Little League World Series is something of an equivalent. And the fact that it's now broadcast all of the tournament on ESPN and uh, has developed the facility that it has at Williamsport is something like that. I mean, in a sense, the Japanese high school national tournaments that you refer to that had been previously middle school tournaments until after the war are somewhere between March Madness on the university level and the Little League World Series uh, on the youth level. And it obviously speaks to the school focus of Baseball. There's Little League in Japan, but really when you get into high school, the high school teams have the, uh, the lion's share of attention. It also speaks to the role that the newspapers, Asahi and Mainichi in the case of high school, have played since the early 20th century in promoting the sport. I mean, this was a sport, this was a tournament that these two national newspapers invested huge amount of media attention to. And so it was this relationship between the sport itself um, and the newspaper attention to it and the ability to, to take this moment, you know, the sort of the, the teenagers and um, it, it's the level of sport at which the pure amateur spirit 
um, can be most foregrounded. So I think there are a number of elements that led to its uh, assuming you know, the importance that you, that you mentioned. It's really at the center of the, ja or for a time, at the center of the Japanese sort of sports year. Um, the fact also that it's played in the same stadium year after year makes it different, say, from our Final Four or even the Super Bowl. I mean, Koshien as a sacred ground over the years <coughs> accumulates so many memories, um, so many games that take place in the same, on the same soil. So I think there are a number of elements that make this such a special uh, sports uh, uh, event and history in Japan. <coughs> One other, one other aspect on uh, Japanese high school baseball is that each of the team represents a uh, prefecture, uh, Todofuken, which is seven, eight ken. And when you win your tournaments, each of the prefectures, the whole prefecture is behind the team and supporting the team and uh, for their team to win the championship. So it's not about just the baseball but it's a pride of the prefecture and the people of the prefecture wanting to support the team. So you have the whole nation watching to see if they could win. I think uh, that's one of the... How about maybe one more question back there? say one thing, but I'd rather hear from uh, people who are more directly involved. You know, there are a number of cases in the history of world baseball, the Negro Leagues being one, uh, Dominican Republic being another, Cuba being a third. That is where you have vibrant, independent baseball cultures uh, which encounter Major League Baseball at different moments. We know what happened in the case of the Negro Leagues. Um, they immediately dissolved. The Dominican Republic took longer, but there you had a very strong independent baseball culture that has become secondary to Major League Baseball. In the case of Cuba, of course, through very draconian political uh, structures, it has retained itself as stridently independent, although it may just be a matter of time before that happens. So the question is, what is Japan? Is it like the Negro Leagues? Is it like the Dominican Republic? Is it like Cuba? Or will it find another way of retaining independence at the level at which it now plays? Um, I think, I mean, personally, at the moment, um, one has to adopt at least a cautious, if not pessimistic, view of its ability to retain itself, as I say, at this level. Anybody else want to? あの、日本の野球はですね、まずアメリカに非常にまねをするという、良くても悪くても真似をする。悪いのでも真似をしちゃうという。特にあの、FA ですね。FA で、え、ま、日本人の選手が、ま、さかと思う。FA でアメリカ
あの田沢がアメリカと契約したら2年間は日本に帰ってきてできないよと急にそういうことを決めるわけですよこういうことは非常にね遅れてるんですよねだからもう少し、えー、まあコミッショナーの初めですね、えー、そのーオーナーたちが真剣に考えてやらないと、えー、今あの日本はあのマイナーリーグのほかに、えー、地域密着のためにいくつかの,あのリーグができていますそれで、えーまあ、野球を盛んにやっていこうと思うんですけど、まあ、だけど日本人は野球がものすごく好きですからまずあのちょっと、まあ、給料を抑えるというようなことをしないとね、えー、存続できないような状態になってますけど、まあ、これはあなくなることは絶対ありません。Unfortunately or fortunately,、uh, Japan imitates anything that the US does, whether for good or bad. Uh, one of those, those、um, uh, things that Japan has imitated is the free agency system. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, they uh, implemented it without realizing that Japanese players might go to the US rather than be a free agent for, and go to another team、uh, in Japan.、Um, and、uh, so it was done without much、uh, thinking through what might happen once the free agency system was put into place. So, the owners have to rethink some of this, uh, these um, uh, different um, strategies that they're using.、Uh, in America,、uh, people do think about what would, might be the worst case, the worst case scenario, and then how to deal with that situation. In Japan, we seem to only think about the best case scenario、uh, and that everything will be, turn out all right somehow. Uh, so now we have, of course, Japanese players、uh, coming to the US. Of, of course, for a better salary, they would.、Uh, Tazawa is、uh, signing with Boston. And、uh, now, in Japanese,、uh, on the Japan side, they're saying he can't come back to Japan for two years, making restrictions like that on uh, some uh, players. Uh, so, uh, the commissioner on down,、uh, the owners as well,、uh, must think、uh, more seriously about what kind of effect their policies uh, have. Uh, uh, Japan has some minor league um, uh, 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 teams and playing too, and also they've、uh, started to develop regional leagues to help with、um, revitalizing、uh, regions in Japan. Uh, so, those are some of the、uh, things that might help in terms of um, uh, increasing um, interest and、uh, focus on Japanese baseball. In the end, Japanese love baseball. Uh, so, um, I think uh, uh, thinking about things like salary caps and that sort of、um, uh, uh, process、uh, might have to be done,、uh, but I don't think baseball will disappear from Japan. You know what? I know there are、uh, a great number of questions still out there, but、um, we probably do need to wrap up the formal section of our time here today.、Uh, we do have sushi and、uh, beer back there.、Uh, our panelists are going to be kind enough to hang out for a little while and、uh, take your questions, chat with you.、Uh, so let's do that. Let me just、uh, say, you know, Professor Kelly mentioned the,、uh, the newspapers sponsoring.、Uh, Uh, baseball. I do need to thank our co sponsor on this event, Yomiri Shimbun, and the Department of Athletics. Also, thank the Consulate General of Japan, San Francisco, for helping advertise this event.、Um, tomorrow, we have the next part of this event, two o'clock, Berkeley Art Museum, the screening of American Pastime, a Warner Brothers film about baseball and the role of baseball in、uh, the Japanese American、uh, incarceration during World War II. Uh, it, it should be a moving film. The、um, uh, associate producer of the film is here to talk about the making of the film. So, our, our, our event continues tomorrow. Our event continues here with our reception. Would you please help me thank Professor William Kelly from Yale, Andrew Gord from Harvard,、uh, our translator, Beth Carey,、uh, Murakami Masanori, and、uh, Warren c r o m a r t y Please help me thank them once again. Okay, I, I, this, is, this is how we're going to end this thing. This is how I always end the end of the day in Japan. I want everybody to stand up, please. Onigashimasu. Mina sama, onigashimasu. Isho ni, banzai kudasai. Would you banzai with me three times all together? Say no. Banzai! 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 Hey, no, man. Thank you.